Psalm 139. Psalm 139. This is about uh, uh, God's perfect knowledge of who you and I are. God says, look, I know you. I love you. In Jeremiah, he says, I have a future and a hope for you. God says, listen, here's the deal. I want you to be a part of my house. I want you to be a part of my family. I sent my son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. And if it was just you, I would have still sent my son to die for you because I love you that much. And so we see in Psalm 139 that the psalmist here starts writing about, and, and this is a, a psalm of David, King David. And by the way, to give you an idea of King David, if you don't know who he is, he was a wretched man. And you go, he was? I thought he was a man after God's own heart. How many look at me like, pastor, you got it wrong, right? He was a man after God's own heart. God even says in his word that, look, King David was a man after my own heart. What it meant was, because King David, he was a, he was a low down, low down nasty guy. He takes another man's wife. Then he kills the husband to keep the wife. Then he tries to hide it all. Low down, man. Somebody say, low down. Low down. All right, right? Because that's what he is. It's like, oh my goodness, here he is. He's a liar. He's a murderer. And God says, this is a man after my own heart. So David writes this psalm about what God thinks of him and you and me because here's what I know and what the Bible tells us. Every one of us are just low down. Every one of us are just nasty old sinners saved by grace if you're saved and just getting the ride, the ride that God put in place if you're not. But he's got a beautiful plan for us. And what I want you to see and understand is that he knows us and still loves us. How many of you are like, hmm, I did some pretty bad things. I don't know how he can love me. Amen? Amen. I'm telling you, I rode that train for a long, long time before I got saved. And so here David, a lowdown man after God's own heart, writes this about the knowledge that God has of us. Verse 1, and we're going to read through. And I'm just going to stop and preach. And boy, I'm telling you, this is... Uh, <clears throat> this is um, yeah, just ride, just ride with me. <laughs> Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. <clears throat> so David stops. I'm going to stop right here. David says, listen. You, you know everything about me. You know everything about me. Let me tell you what the scriptures say. The scriptures say that God knows our every thought. He knows our every intent of the heart. And he still wants us. Jesus said that he was, that he dreaded going to the cross because of the pain, but he was excited for the joy that was set before him. And the joy that was set before Jesus was you and I. We are the Father's gift to the Son, and He had to die on the cross, shed His blood to receive His gift. He had to go through incredible torture, incredible pain, and He was willing to go through it, not because of the pain, because we saw three times, right? He says, if this cup could pass over me, let it pass. In other words, if I don't have to hang on that cross and go through this horrible beating and have spikes driven through my, my wrist, because it, it, this is part of the hand. If, if they were to run the spike in here on Jesus, it would have slipped right through the joints of the fingers. So this right here is still part of the hand, and there's a, there's a spot there that they would drive the stake in, and so it would hang all of his body weight. And then the same in his feet with them crossed straight through 
And the idea was that if he hung, it would, it would cut the, the air off of his lungs. And so he would try to push himself up. And that's what all of them would do that would, would die on the cross. They would, it was one of the most gruesome deaths that you could, that you could have. And he would push himself up to get the pressure off of his lungs. But he's got a spike running through his ankles or right below his ankles. And can you imagine how difficult that would be to try and get the pressure off your lungs? And before that, which you think, oh, that's horrible. Let's, let's just back up for one more moment. How about the beating that he took before he even got to the top of Golgotha? It said that he was beaten so bad that he was unrecognizable as a man. He had a beard, and it said that the people, out of their anger and their rage and their hate, ripped his beard out and took chunks of flesh with it, leaving his face completely disfigured. He was whipped with a cat of nine tails, and on that on the end of that cat of nine tails, it was it was uh, uh, pieces of glass and metal. So that when, when they hit you with it and they pulled back, it would latch into the flesh and it would pull that with it. And you say, Pastor, you're pretty graphic. No, I'm, t I'm telling you. I'm telling you what the Word of God says that Jesus went through and he called it you and I the joy to go through that because he knew he was getting you and I. This, this isn't no light matter. This is someone giving up everything for you and I. Real question, how sweet of a gift are you for somebody, right? And yet we see here that King David says, God knows your every thought. And so um, if your thought is just on sin or wrong or doing wrong or everything that goes against God continually, he knows it. And yet he still desires for you to be a part of his family. That, that's astounding to me. Because if you and I were like, oh, you're, you're nasty, you're ugly, you're mean, you're evil, blah, blah, blah. You need to get out of here and don't ever come back and I never want to see you again. And God's like, oh, you're nasty, you're evil, you're mean, you're ugly, but I love you, come. You see the difference? The Quran says, kill everyone. The Bible says, no, you, don't, you know what? You love your enemy. And you go out and you convince them and tell them and do all you can that Jesus Christ is Lord so that they might know the Son of God and surrender and be a part of heaven. It's the, the craziest dynamic ever. And as I process the dynamic and I process the love of God, and I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's so difficult to comprehend because I look at some people and I'm like, Lord, wow, this is a challenge for me to love them. <laughs> I need your help. And yet God's like, mm, I'm going to die for every person because every person needs me to get to heaven. What an amazing dynamic. And, and King David here, he's just saying, listen, I want you to know that God says, I know you're sitting down. I know you're rising up. I know uh, uh, your thoughts from afar off. I comprehend everything. Uh, listen, he is acquainted with all of our ways. And he goes on, verse 4, There is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged behind me and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot obtain it. And so King David is saying, listen, <clears throat> you know all my good words and my ugly words. And yet you still love me and you want me. I can't understand it. And that's what I'm telling you today. I, I just shake my head in awe and amazement and wonder and go, how can such a loving, amazing, righteous God want me? Especially before I was saved. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I was a rodent. <laughs> but I was a king rodent. <laughs> and yet God says, no, nope, I still want you. It doesn't matter what you've done. 
doesn't matter what you've done. I used to say, hey, man, uh, I got the T-shirt for that. I, you know, or I paved that highway. And, and, and today I shamelessly say it, but I am amazed that God says, yeah, I know exactly what you've done, and I still want you. And King David says, I'm, I can't even, I can't attain it. It's, it's so ah, uh, amazing to me. Verse 7, <clears throat> where can I go from your spirit? Now here, and he's talking about where can I go from your Holy Spirit? right? Like, where can I run that you're not there? That's what he's saying. Where can I go that you're not there? And he, he, uh, uh, he goes on, he says, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utter, uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. And for, for those of you who may or may not know the scriptures, every time you read the scriptures and you read about the right hand of, of God, the Father, it's the, the power hand. Like that's where all the power is. That's where everything is. And David says, you hold me with your most powerful hand, your right hand. That assures that you're not going to get away. It assures that you're not going to slip through the cracks. It assures you that God is in control. It's just an, an, an amazing thing when you, when you uh, I'm, I'm literally, I'm struggling to find words about how amazing this is, God's love for you and I. Oh, wretched man that I am. And God says, that's all right, I want you to come to me. You know, we think that, that, we have, that we've done a lot of bad things. Oh, and I assure you, we have. <laughs> I was talking to a gentleman out in the hallway right before coming in. And we were talking. He's like, man, I've done a lot of bad things. And I'm like, dude, let's not compare notes because I might win. Amen? God looks at sin as sin. Are you ready? If you've told a lie, you're just as guilty as murder. If you stole something, you're just as guilty as murder. And I'm using murder because people use that as the pinnacle, right? Well, I haven't killed anybody. <laughs> yes, you have. You killed Jesus because if he wouldn't have died, you could and I couldn't live. So our sin put him on the cross. And his shed blood keeps us off the cross. It's an amazing thing. And so when we look at it and we go, well, I've messed up, I can assure you you're not alone. And I can also assure you that you haven't paved a road. How about Paul? Let's look at Paul just for a second. Paul gets saved on the Damascus Road. Paul's already killed a multitude of Christians, right? I mean, he's, he sees Christians, his whole goal is to kill them, take them out. That's his job. His job as a Pharisee and commander in the army, the Roman army, was to kill anybody that believed in Jesus. And he readily admits it that he was the Hebrew of Hebrews and he, had, he was a zealot for God on a perfect level. In other words, I did what I believed was right and I was killing everybody because that's what the right thing was. And if you believed in Jesus, you went down by the sword because Paul would kill you. At the time, his name was Saul. Can you imagine how many people Saul killed or that he put in prison? He's on a road to Damascus. He's heading to Damascus because you know what he's going to do? He's going to wipe out the masses. He's got one agenda when he gets there. And his agenda is to kill the multitude. That's what Paul's going to do. God stops him on the road. He's Saul. Saul. And he trembles in fear because he hears him and there's this great light and he's blinded. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? <laughs> I'm the one that you're persecuting, you're trying to kill. Paul says at that moment, he surrenders to the Lord everything, gives his life to Christ. 
God changes his name from Saul to Paul, and then Paul goes on and becomes this amazing, amazing evangelist telling people about Jesus and building churches. Just out of curiosity, how nasty do you think Paul was? <laughs> and God saved him. How bad do you think David was? And yet he was a man after God's own heart. Let me assure you, you're not so bad that God can't save you. Let me assure you, you can't go to the depth of sin that God can't pull you up out of. Let me assure you of that today. David even says, man, God's everywhere and can get you from anywhere. Let's move on. So then he says here in verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. He's like, God, you, you can turn night into dar- uh, darkness into, into light. You, you've got this power. Understand, God is not limited. You can't put him in a box. So many people try. And so many people not only try to put him in a box, but they try to put him in a bottle. So he's a genie. Oh, Lord, give me three wishes. Oh, Lord, give me three more. Oh, Lord, how about three more on top of those three and three, right? We just keep using God as a genie thinking everything's all good, but the day's going to come where God's like, you know what? You can't use me. I came here to save you, and all you want is what you can get. You don't want me. See, there's there's a separation. That's where man is not saved by God because man just wants his own salvation his way, and God says, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. So anyway, here we go. So he goes on and he says, uh, verse 12, Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. God is not limited. Verse 13, for you four, and, and, and the other thing about dark, you know, we're blinded by the darkness. God's not. That's, that's his whole point. God's not limited. Even darkness doesn't blind him. He sees everything, everywhere, every time, all about us. Verse 13, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. You made me. Guys, listen, I need you to hear me. And it just is what it is, right? Abortion is destroying life. But ladies, if you've had an abortion, it's still not a sin to take you out of the hand of God. It was just a really poor decision that God will still forgive if you come to the cross. There's nothing that God won't forgive. There's nothing that God won't cleanse us from and forgive us from, and wipe us our slate clean, white as snow, the Bible says. But I want you to see in 13, you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. It's a life in the womb, and God finds that life just as precious as he does any life. And and ladies, I'm just telling you, if you carry around that weight, don't carry it around. Give it to God. Just surrender. I already told you, everyone in this room are low downs, low lives. <laughs> Every one of us. Verse 14. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. I want you to see in verse 14 that he says, listen, I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Listen, not only fearfully and wonderfully made, you know, do you realize that if you go back to Genesis, in Genesis, it talks about the, the, uh, everything that was created, and we get to the sixth day. Everything from day one to day six or halfway through day six God created by just speaking it into existence. Let there be the sun, the moon, the stars. Guess what? Sun, moon, the stars. 
Separate the water from the land. Guess what? Separated the water from the land. I mean, everything God wanted to do, he just did. He spoke it. Boom, it was done. But then he gets to man, you and I. King David says, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. He gets to man, and we find in Genesis where God says, hey, Jesus and Holy Spirit. Now, you don't read that. He says us, and he's talking to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. It's, it, when we read about Elohim in the Bible, and in Elohim, God, in the beginning, God created in the beginning, Elohim created means God plural. All three were involved. One God, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we find in, in Genesis chapter 3, the Father says, hey, let us make everyone in our image. And then we read where God took the time to form us and then took his own breath and breathed life into us. And man was not spoken into existence. Man was specially made for existence. Nothing else did God do that with but you and I. So when David says, look, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And then he goes in and he says, marvelous are your works. Have you ever stopped to look at yourself? Man, how does my eyeball work so amazing, right? How does my heart just keep pumping? Like the energy is always there. It's just like, I don't have to plug in and recharge. It's not a battery, but yet it never stops well, until it does. And then, right? I mean, it's like, how does all this happen? Which by the way, once it stops, you don't ask yourself how it stopped. You just know it's over. Um, how about our hands and our fingers and the dexterity that we have? It's, it's amazing. We're marvelous, our God's works. He's talking about his creation, how he was formed and made. How our brain works. How your body, you can get, you can get a cut and then it heals itself. It's just amazing to me. How, ladies, you give birth to new life. It's a miracle. And he even says that children are a gift from him. Some of you don't act like it, but nonetheless, you're a gift from God. It's wonderful are your works. Guys, I, you, you need to see, and I think that's what God wants today, is he just wants me to point out how much he loves us. And, and for those of you who are, or regular attenders, you know, I don't talk on love a whole lot. <laughs> I just roll through the scriptures. But God wants you to see how much he loves you. And not just loves you as a person, but look at the detail that he has put into each and every one of us. We have our own DNA, nobody else like you. You have your own fingerprint, nobody else like you. Your own palm print, nobody else like you. How amazing is that? That you can be identified amongst two million people and they can identify you out of two million people. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, if we came from evolution, you would think that all of us would have a common denominator. Oh, wait a minute, we do. If you look at evolution, we all have this tailbone where our tail broke off. Stupid. Anyway, okay. Sorry, I, I digress just for a moment. Guys, he says here in 14, marvelous are your works. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. I find this passage interesting because when you read this passage, the first place that I want to go to is Romans chapter 1. 
Romans chapter one, starting in verse 18, goes down through, and I think, I think in, in Romans 1, 20 or 21, he says that he put the knowledge of him into every man. Why do you think, that, why do you think you have this desire either to recognize God or you're in search of God or a higher power, or you believe in a higher power, but you don't, you don't want to label it, right? Why do you think you have that? The reason you don't label it is because uh, society has convinced you God doesn't exist, but you know something exists. Why? We read in Romans, God says he put it into every man, his existence. And so therefore, you can't deny his existence. As a matter of fact, God even says that if you look around and everything that he's made, you see him. And then if you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and you look at creation, what do you see? Him. And he says, hey, the Holy Spirit hovered over the whole earth. If you go back to Romans chapter 1, he says that you see the Godhead, that's all three, and you see the, the all three in all of creation. So David, even back in the Old Testament, when he says marvelous, or he says my soul knows very well in verse 14, I think that's verse 14, let me get my glasses back on. Yeah, in verse 14, <laughs> my soul Guys, every one of you sitting in here and everyone out in that world knows God exists. They're just choosing different titles for him. Maybe they don't know any better. Maybe they've never been to a church that preaches and teaches the word of God in context of what it actually means. But they know. They know. Because God put it in and King David says, my soul knows very well. Look here in verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. When he was formed in the womb, God knew. God could see him in the womb. That's what he means by this. But then I love this, and we were talking about it. He says, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Skillfully made, remember framed in the first part, every, it was skillfully done. God didn't just throw us together. We didn't just happen. We didn't evolve. I promise you, we didn't evolve. God says he made us, and he made each and every one of us special. Why do you think we are so identifiable as being very specific individuals? Take twins. They look alike. Some of them act alike, talk alike, do the same hair and everything else together. But let them get tested on their DNA, and they're different. DNA, science, God's science, God's DNA, will tell you which twin is which. It's just an amazing thing. How about ladies? Uh, uh, they can, all they need is your bones, and they can tell that you were a woman. Guys, all they need is our bones, they can tell us that we're a man. That's amazing. Why did God do that? He made us so special and so unique. And just for the record, the Bible only speaks of man and woman. Two genders, not 74. It's he and she, not Z. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. Embrace who God made you. He, and if you're evil, he didn't make you evil. He wants you to be righteous. He wants you to be holy. But embrace your uniqueness of who God made you to be. Just embrace it, man, and be all that you can be, all that God's made you to be. Look here in verse 16. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. I wasn't even born yet. I wasn't even born yet. And look what he says. You saw me, and in your book, I was written. I was written down before you ever even formed me in the womb. Guys, are you digging how God's loving you and made you and made you special? So if you're walking around and you're like, oh, I'm worthless. Oh, my goodness. You have listened to one too many lies. God can't love me. Do you know what I've done? Oh, you are so deceived. Why would God love me? I'm nobody. Are you kidding? 
Marvelous are his works in you and I. See, people get their identity from the world. And when we get our identity from the world, we never know who we are because the world changes constantly. But you get your identity from God and you'll stand like a rock in any fire. You got to quit believing the world and start believing God. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are God's works in you and I. And then he goes on. Verse 16, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they are they are uh, they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. God had planned for King David before King David knew he was born, before he was even in the womb. God did the same for you and I. Don't get hung up in the lies of the world. And if someone tells you that you're no good and you're worthless and you're useless, man, you tell them, yeah, won't you convince my God of that? Don't you fall into that junk? Because God doesn't make junk. King David, man, he's telling us, look here in 17. He, okay, I'm... Oh. <laughs> man. How good is God? How precious also are your thoughts to me, O oh God. God wants the very best for us. You know who sabotages our life? <laughs> we do. <laughs> we think we got a better idea, so we do it our way, and we ignore God's way, and all of a sudden we fall into a hole. We get out, we're pretty muddy, messed up, bruised up, cut up, looking pretty nasty, and then God's like, hey, listen, this is what I want you to do. And you're like, I got this, God, you stay back. Okay, God says, all right, go ahead. We fall in another hole. We get a little more bruised up, beat up, busted up, muddied up, get out, and we're like, God's like, hey, uh, man, I'm going to clean you up. I want to use you. I want to show you. I want to love you. I want to. I want you to be a part of me. You're like, God, I got this. Just stay out there. Chill out. Don't leave me alone, because you're not going to tell me what to do and what not to do. And so we go running again, boom, in another hole. And then next thing you know, finally, eventually, if we're smart enough and some never are. <laughs> but if we're smart enough, we stop and we're like, okay, Lord, what do you want? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'm beat up. I'm tired. I'm cut up. I'm bruised up. I'm muddied up. I, 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 I surrender. And God's like, okay. Listen, he wants us before we start down the road, and he wants us when we're done with the road. The most amazing thing in life is how God loves us, wants us, and how precious his thoughts are toward us and for us. Oh God, how great is the sum of them all, right? Or of all of, of them. It means all of these thoughts, all of these desires, all of these plans that God has for you and me, it's not just one. It's a multitude. The plans and the desires he has for you and I to be amazing in the world, not in the amazing in the eyes of man, but in the amazing in the eyes of God. And some of the most amazing men in the eyes of God are men you and I have never heard of. But they've made the biggest impact in this world for him. And he says, man, how great is the sum of all those precious thoughts that you have toward me. All right, let's, let's move on. Here we go. Verse 18. How many thought we would never get through this? <laughs> Just, uh, for those of you who visit, uh, you have no clue what a miracle this is. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Verse 17. Oh, how precious, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. God's thoughts toward us are more in number than sand, the sand on a, just take one beach, let alone the, the, the sand of the world. When I wake, I am still with you. It's not a dream. This is real deal. Verse 19. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, oh God. And then he goes on and says, hey, <clears throat> all the evil that comes into my life, get rid of it. Let's, let's just read it. 
Verse 19, oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Because his enemies, uh, uh, he was fighting enemies, and he's just writing this, and he's really writing this to remind himself of who God is, so he stays in the fight. Uh, verse 20, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain, Lord. He's talking to God. Verse 21, uh, do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? Do I loathe, do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. And because remember, the Bible also tells us to be angry, but do not sin. What does it look like to be angry, but not sin? It means that this isn't about us. It's about God. And we're angry because there's no righteousness in someone. We're not angry because of who they are. We're angry because uh, uh, they're, they're not of God or they're not showing the righteousness of God. And so it's a righteous anger that we get angry about. Usually people get angry because they don't get their own way. He says that that's, that's not a righteous anger. You get angry because of sin that is in you or around you. And then he goes on, um, verse 23, he says, search me, O God, and know my heart, try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. Verses 23 and 24, he says this, and I want to challenge you with this. God, look at everything in me, my heart. Because guys, I'm telling you, even Jesus says, it's not what goes in the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out. Because what comes out comes from his heart. And so King David says, Lord, search my heart. Look in that deep, deep into my heart, my whole heart, everything about my heart. You, Lord, look at it. And if there's any ugly, any sin, any nasty, anything, show it to me, Lord. And then David repents of it. See, most of us, we're like, oh, it's so ugly in there. We just got to hide it. And God's like, don't hide it. Bring it to the cross. Just bring it to the cross. And David says, just search my heart. Show me if there's any wickedness in there. Show me. And so when he says, show me here in, in verse 23, search me, know my heart, try me, know my anxieties. Because how many here are, uh, you, you look at the news and you just get a little anxious. Right? And so he says, know my anxieties. See if there's uh, any wicked in me. And then lead me to the way of righteousness. Lead me to the way of repentance. Lead me to the way of you. And so David just, he just wants a cleansing and a closer relationship with God. And I want to offer that to you today. Some of you, you're walking in wickedness. You, you know. You, you know you shouldn't be doing the things you're doing. And we see in the scriptures that God knows your heart. He sees you. He knows everything you are, every person you are. He knows everything you're going to speak, everything you're going to do. And as those who don't want to repent, you're going to pay a heavy price. But to those who seek God's face, you get delivered, not just here on earth, but in heaven, right? Right? And so I want to give you this opportunity. The Bible says that Jesus Christ died for your sins and he died for mine. The Bible says that we're all sinners, that we need Jesus to get to heaven. There's no way to heaven except through him. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No person gets to the Father, which is in heaven, except through me. If you deny me, you've denied my father. Here's one thing I know, and I, talk, I was talking to my wife's cousin this morning, and I said, you know, the truth is, James says we're not promised tomorrow. Our life is but a vapor. We're here for a short time, and then we vanish away. One thing nobody's escaped is death, and you won't be the first to do that. We need Jesus. And you say, well, I don't, I don't believe that. Well, how is what you're believing holding up? 
People will ask me all the time, uh, Pastor, you're not afraid of what's going on? <clears throat> I'm not afraid of what's going on. I, I read the book. I, I know who wins. I win. We win. I'm not afraid of it. I just hate to see it coming. What are you going to do? Take my life and promote me to heaven? <laughs> okay, I'm in line. We don't wish it on anyone, but when you know where you're going, you know who your Savior is. The Bible says fear is gone. God says, I've not given you the spirit of fear, but of boldness and a sound mind and love. Why should I live in fear? He's not giving me that spirit. The spirit of fear is not the spirit of God. It's the spirit of our enemy, Satan. And so many people are driven by fear. He wins. God says, I've emboldened you. I've empowered you. I came to die for you so that you would have life. But it's only through Jesus. So I want to give you an opportunity to receive Christ as your Savior. <clears throat> The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, and 10, if you guys will bring that passage up for me, Zach, Romans 10, 9, and 10, chapter 10, verse 9, verse 10, Romans, giving him time to pull it up. In Romans 10, 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, and believe in your heart, remember it's here, because this is all that man is, not here, here. The real you, the real deal, who you are and who you know you are here. Not who you wish you were here, but who you know you are here. <clears throat> if you confess with your, uh, go back to, yeah, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and, and confess that he's the Savior, he's your, your Lord, and believe in your heart <clears throat> that God raised Jesus from the dead, that the Father raised Jesus from the dead, then you will be saved. The uh, first thing I want you to notice, hang right here in this verse for me, please. The first thing I want you to notice that there's nothing you got to do. There's, there's no works. You can't be good enough, can't give enough money, uh, can't do enough good, you can't, uh, uh, you, you can't, there, there's nothing you can do. Whatever it is you think you can do, you can't do it. It's not going to get you there. And people say, well, I got to be good. Well, then how good is good enough? By whose standard? And when did you cross the finish line? So you can't be good. And by the way, what if you could do more good works than the next man? The next man's out. That means God chose you, found favor with you. Doesn't work that way. Go to the next verse. 10. For with the heart. See, here's what God did. God made us so wonderful, we find in, in Psalm 139. He loved us so much. He explains that we see it clearly, and this is what he says. I have made salvation equal for every human being. Because every human being has to do one thing. With their heart, believe. You could be on your deathbed. You're like, deathbed salvation? Oh, yeah, it's real. Here's what has to happen. A man's got to realize he's a sinner. He's got to believe in verse 9 that the Father raised Jesus from the dead because Jesus died on the cross to cover your sin and my sin and make a way to heaven. Because all throughout history, innocent blood had to be shed to cover the guilty. And in the Old Testament, they did it with animals, and then Jesus came, and Jesus, cast, like all the Old Testament of, of the shedding of the blood of the animals was like them writing a check. And then when Jesus died on the cross, he was the bank that cashed all the checks. And now it's just Jesus. Plus nothing, minus nothing. And what we got to do is for with the heart, believe unto Jesus. You recognize you're a sinner. You realize that you need Jesus, that he's the savior of the world. And then with your mouth, I surrender. 
Because see, you've already done it in your heart. If you surrender it in your heart, then with your mouth, it's confession of what your heart believes. It's that simple. And you go, oh, it's that easy? Here's the problem. Getting rid of your pride and making enough room for Jesus. That's people's problem. Salvation is easy. This man dying to himself, that becomes difficult. And he says, for with the heart one believes on the righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Here's what you've got to believe. Here's the gospel. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Lamb of the world, the, the uh, uh, Savior of the world, who came, died on the cross, conquered death and hell, came out of the grave, and he's at the right hand of the Father today. I didn't say you had to understand it all. I said you had to believe it. It's that simple. That's it. Plus nothing, minus nothing. That's what the gospel says. Your struggle is believing it. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the preaching of the word of God. I've done my part. I've explained it. If you don't get to heaven, it's not because of what I did. It's because of what you didn't do. And that was belief. It's that simple. So I'd like for everyone to bow their head, close their eyes, and just take a moment. And if you're here and you're struggling with everything you just heard, because, man, there was a ton of information, I want you to say this. Just, just, Quietly to yourself, <clears throat> God in heaven, show me, show me. For some of you, you heard this and the Holy Spirit has already moved through you and you already believe. You're like, oh my goodness, this is it. Believe in your heart. If it's your desire, if you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. He conquered death and hell. He rose from the grave. He's at the right hand of the Father. I didn't ask you to understand it all, but you believe it. The Holy Spirit will, will move through you. You'll know. And quietly in your heart, I want you to pray this prayer. The words aren't, aren't magical. They're not going to save you. It's just a road map that takes you through the process and gives you a time stamp where you can say, this day, with my heart, I made a conscious decision to believe on Jesus and, and, and surrender my life. That's, that's all the prayer does. The words aren't magical. There's no, there's no amazingness in them. It is just uh, helps you walk through so that you can go, nope, I made a decision that day with my heart to receive Christ as my Savior. If that's your desire, you pray this prayer quietly in your heart. Jesus, today I believe that you are the Savior of the world. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you conquered death and hell. I believe you're at the right hand of the Father. Jesus, I don't understand all of it, but I surrender. I give you my life. I believe you are my Savior and I surrender my life to you. Jesus, I ask that you forgive me of all the sin I've ever done, all the wrong I've ever done. And since the Bible says it was already written down, you know it. You know how ugly it is. But I also believe your word that you wash us white as snow and you cast our sins as far as the east is from the west and you don't remember them anymore. I repent of my sin, of all the wrong. I'm no longer going to keep going in that direction of serving myself and going against you. But I turn from that. I repent. I turn. And now, Lord, I'm walking toward the cross. I'm walking toward you. And I'm going to do my very, very best to do it your way. 
I understand good works aren't going to get me to heaven. Good works are just going to show I'm on my way. Good works are going to show that I believe in you. Father, today I am yours. We at Connecting Point Church are excited to have you join us. When you come, you'll experience a friendly, lively, and casual family-like atmosphere that welcomes you as you are. Our messages combine straightforward biblical truths, humor, and life-changing challenges for you to learn and grow in God's Word. We believe in connecting people to Christ, to the plans and gifts He has for them, and with people in our community who share these values. We also believe in reaching out to our local area and the regions beyond. We're dedicated to being a place where your entire family can believe, belong, and become all that God intends you to be. Discover the abundance of life in Jesus Christ as you begin to understand the roots of the problems and learn to apply the tools for you to triumph over your challenges today. It'll be a breath of fresh air in this unsettled world.